an interactive learning environment to understand how Seattle native Jimi Hendrix not only changed the music industry, but influenced Paul Allen. You see, and this is what's interesting, when you think about building a creative society and the role of arts and culture and diversity and tolerance and making sure every single kid and person has the chance to use their creative talents. Because it wasn't Albert Einstein who was the influence of Paul Allen. It wasn't a great scientist. It wasn't Thomas Edison or another great inventor who was the one who motivated Paul Allen. It wasn't a get rich quick, be a robber baron, make a billion dollars. No, the person who influenced Paul Allen was a young African-American kid named Jimi Hendrix, born in a ghetto in Seattle, who picked up his guitar and, and, and migrated all around the United States and all around the world to learn how to play it. And he heard blues, and he heard rhythm and blues, and he heard jazz, and he heard soul. He heard folk music. He idolized Bob Dylan. He went to Nashville. He played in Nashville. He learned country music. He moved to Europe. He took two Englishmen to become part of his band. He added psychedelic sounds. He changed his look. He became a hybrid of John Lennon and Bob Dylan and James Brown and Little Richard. He changed the way music was heard. But not only musically, technologically. He took fuzz pedals and wah-wah pedals and echo effects and reverbs, added rotary speakers behind him, and then, when he got enough money, he built his own complex, his electric Ladyland Studios, at the forefront of technology and music to enable him to create the sounds that now are associated with one of the greatest changes in the way the guitar and popular music was played. When it all comes down to it, it's not that inventors equal inventors. It's not that scientists equal scientists. It's not that billionaires make more billionaires. Um, Jimi Hendrix died when he was 27. It was a young African-American musician who motivated and mobilized and incentivized one of the greatest software minds of our time. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Oh la la, <laughs> how to pick up from you. Thank you is just a very poor and small word, but that's all I can say. You did a wonderful speech, and you really added, mess added, uh, added um, meaning to the creative class message. Okay, I know that you would like to answer questions, and we have got two micros down here on the floor. We have got Louise and Annette. So if people want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Ask a short question and preferably in English. Hello, Mr. Florida. A couple of years ago, you wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review about the SAS Institute. Do you still see this company as an example to follow? Could we get your name, please, sir? My name is Dean Heine of Bile Business College. Um, SAS is a very interesting company. We wrote that article, and I, and I hope someday to write a book on the managing uh, creativity. But I think, yes, the, and the interesting thing about this company is Goodnight, the founder of the company, wrote the, book, wrote the article with me. Um, his wife actually is very supportive of arts and culture. Um, but when I asked Goodnight, I said, have you studied management? He said, no. He said, I just do what makes sense. I just do what it takes to motivate and keep my creative people excited and, and happy. The other thing he said that's very powerful is it's not just about software developers. A good night doesn't outsource. And he talked about his landscaping crew. This was his example, not his developers. And he said, you know, when you come to our, our facility, the first thing you see is our gardens and our landscape, and they have sculpture, beautiful sculpture in a natural environment. He said, my landscapers are critical, and, and the way I incentivize them is not only paying them money, of course I pay them well, but I have to give them the opportunity to be artists, because that's what they truly want. Their intrinsic motivation is to make a beautiful landscape and make it exceptional. And if I understand that, and if I can, if I can make sure my landscapers feel that way about their work, uh, making the software developers and the technology engineers uh, happy and more excited will be an easy task. Yes. Easy one. <laughs> 
My name is Julie, I'm from Copenhagen Business School. I was wondering, is it valid to talk about conventional brand strategies from communities towards the creative class? First of all, it's good to meet you, and I hope we get to collaborate, because it's such a wonderful place, and we have a good collaboration with several of your colleagues. Um, the answer to your question is no. Um, and, and the way I will say it's no, it doesn't mean you can't market and you can't excite people about a community, but conventional brand strategies are problematic. And I only say this because in the interviews for Rise of the Creative Class, it came up with regard to Pittsburgh. How do we market Pittsburgh? And when we asked the members of the creative class, they actually gave us some very humorous and interesting responses. And they said, it's kind of like when you go for a high-tech company or creative job fair, and I'm sorry, because I'm one of these guys, there's a middle-aged guy with a belly, and he has the company name t-shirt on, and people don't want to go interview with that company because it doesn't reflect what they think they want to be associated. And they said the way companies recruit is virally. They bring young people back to campus, and they get to know them as friends, and they talk about the company. And, and, and they said, we do not want to be broadcast too. And the one fellow said this, it was very powerful. He said, the way we know a community now is by its identity. And, and he said, just I'll give you one example. There are other ways. It could be great architecture, like a Bilbao effect. It could be a great historic preservation. But he, he had one. He said, we know it by its sound. We know it's by its audio identity. So why Austin, Texas seems appealing to us is because it has this musical thing going on. It, and it might be design and fashion. But the, or it might be technology, but the point was it can't be pushed down. It has to come bottom up and it has to be virally and it has to be, if you will, peer to peer. So I think in developing these strategies, it really is a different way of approaching. Not that this is not important, but it has to be a different way of approaching it.